my name is Matt Robar. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Pure Project. Uh, I'm Jesse Pine. I'm also a founder of Pure Project. My name is Winslow Sawyer. I'm the head pro. Uh, <laughs> My name is Winslow Sawyer. I'm the head brewer here at Pure Project Brewing in San Diego, California. I'm from Ohio originally. Uh, I was born in Michigan. Raised in Ohio, went to college in Ohio, and then moved out here. And I've been in San Diego about 12 years now. Uh, originally from Northern California, born in the Bay Area, grew up in the Sierras, and uh, moved down here in 2006. Um, spent a few years down here, and then moved to Costa Rica for three years, and then moved back here for three years. So, no, I'm not from San Diego. Um, I'm actually from Northern California. Um, I went to high school in Los Angeles and then I'm going to college in um, Santa Cruz. I started brewing in Santa Cruz when I was in college. Um, I couldn't buy beer, so I wanted to still drink the quality of beer that I was used to when I first started drinking um, beer, but everyone wanted to drink Coors Light. So it ended up being that I just ended up making my own beer. I guess it's a long story. <laughs> um, it's something we've told many times, but yeah. I enjoy telling because it's a pretty cool story. Um, Matt and I, both uh, blue collar, or not blue collar, white collar, um, used to work in call, the call center business, uh, primarily financial sales, stuff like that. Um, I had left the US and moved down to Costa Rica, um, took a little sabbatical from uh, the corporate world and went down there and got a little bored and missed craft beer and um, started doing a little bit of home brewing. And um, Matt and I used to go on backpacking trips pretty much every year with a really fun group. And uh, in the Rocky Mountain National Park, we had a conversation about doing different things outside of what we were used to. So, yeah, well, I remember it very distinctly because it was a it was a day that was supposed to be nine miles, and it ended up being like 14 miles, and it was like hailing. Um, yeah. So it's one of those you know long days in the back country where you have nothing to do but talk uh, and just kind of run through everything that's happening in your lives and stuff like that and um, you know the idea got tossed around of you know what about starting a craft brewery what would that look like you know and I think by the end of the trip I think it was a three or four day trip up there um, by the end of the trip uh, you know we kind of had the I guess the outlines for what the um, what the brewery and the brand and all that would look like actually down in Costa Rica. Yeah, we, we tried to open up the brewery down in Costa Rica, but ran into some issues down there and um, eventually had to pull the plug, and that's the, sh the short story. Obviously, there's a lot more to it. Um, but yeah, that's how we got. We, we kind of, I guess, stumbled into it randomly, something that wasn't unexpected, and um, yeah, something we just kind of came across. We were, we were pursuing the brewery in Costa Rica, and kind of all the signs were pointing to it might just not work out with the infrastructure of the country and how things were kind of going in the area and the environmental impact we would have. We were kind of feeling that we were going to probably be pulling the plug on the project. Um, and I think it was maybe the w same weekend that we decided to pull the plug. We made the decision on a Friday and like sometime that weekend, Jesse got a, an email from one of his friends who does commercial real estate up here that was talking about the brewery igniter project and of which we were the first uh, brewery igniter tenant to open here in Miramar. Um, and so he, you were coming back for a wedding, I think if I remember right, came back for a wedding 
and we came out, saw the space, and you know we already had our investors and uh, everything ready to go. So we just kind of, uh, you know, talked to the landlord, cut a deal, and um, you know we were ready to move pretty quick. And then. You came back a month or two later, something along those lines, and that's when we started. Uh, we started interviewing uh, brewers, and we interviewed a lot of them, and uh, finally uh, met Winslow. And he was the youngest out of all of them, but he really seemed to mesh really well with, um, you know, kind of our ethos and what we were looking to create. Yeah, I mean, we interviewed people from you know 40 years of experience all the way to almost no experience at all, and. To us, it was finding somebody that was more of a culture fit, um, somebody that had the same beliefs that we had, um, and our mission is sustainability and using really good ingredients. Um, and he fit that mold and obviously vibed really well with us, and that's something that we've really kept with our growth too, is really hiring for culture, not necessarily for experience, but making sure that we can build this strong foundation of a family here at Pure, and um, Winslow's been a great addition to the team, obviously. So. Um, I like brewing all kinds of beer just because I, it's really important to me to make people happy with the product that I make and although I may not drink every style of beer, I would want to definitely make a style for everyone. Um, one benefit that we have here at Pure Project is we don't necessarily brew to style. We're not necessarily inspired by styles, but the ingredients. So we start with the ingredient and that we try to pair a great style with it that will showcase the ingredients. In my eyes, there's a couple different types of brewers. You have the scientific type, uh, you have the artistic type. Um, he's obviously a combination of both, um, but more on the artistic side. So he likes to experiment a lot, um, really takes you know, the play out of cocktails, uh, the wine industry, even culinary arts, stuff like that, implements it into beer. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that. I think, um, you know, you spoke to Winslow being a little bit uh, you know, being, you know, pretty far on the creative end of things. You know, he definitely has the science background, but he's also extremely creative, right? You know, I call him almost um, kinesthetic, like a chef. Like he can create on the fly, knowing what kind of flavors will pair together. And so you'll find a lot of our beers have really kind of unique twists to um, normal styles that you'll see anywhere, but it'll have a bit of a unique twist. And that's kind of him putting his mark and his creativity to those beers. My background is actually in sustainable agriculture. Um, the ingredients drive all the beers here. We focus on sourcing everything um, and using those ingredients to inspire us um, to create beers. Um, since day one, we've always wanted to use really fresh and organic ingredients. So I'd say outside of styles, it's just kind of the use of fresh organic adjuncts, fruits, spices, and stuff like that that we integrate into our beers. Um, like we always say the, the IPAs keep the lights on, but our heart's in our barrel program, because um, that's truly where it is. Um, but yeah, I'd say we, we do pretty well in, in most styles of beer, and there's a lot that we haven't made yet. Right now we have a seven barrel premier stainless system and we have, geez, how many fermenters do we have now? Right now we have seven. We, we have seven total fermenters. We're looking at maybe, you know, expanding kind of our cellar here uh, in Miramar in the next, uh, you know, six months or so, see where that goes. But uh, right now we produce about 2,000 barrels a year. We source from all over the place, right? Um, a lot of sourcing actually kind of goes back to the roots of, of where we started. So when Matt and I were homebrewing down in Costa Rica. We would literally go to the farmers markets and meet the farmers face to face. And down there, you had access to so many unique spices, uh, fruits, the most exotic things you could ever imagine. And just started grabbing stuff and throwing it in a beer and just talking with the farmers. And they would tell you, you know, what was fresh right now and what was good and what to expect on the road. And, and having that bond with the local community was something that was really awesome about that. Well, 
So the palette of our audience, especially when we started doing Hazy IPA, started leaning more and more towards this kind of juicy, fruity um, flavor profile. So because of that, we just realized, hey, you know, my background's in agriculture. I have a lot of access to amazing um, produce um, in California. So why don't we just give the people what they want and make fruit juice based beers? Um, so right now we're working with a lot of um, local organic farmers here in California, as well as sourcing um, globally for things like tropical fruits, things like mangoes, passion fruit, things like that that don't necessarily grow very well here in California. Um, but we do work hand in hand with some um, San Diego producers. So we actually have our own acreage of strawberries up in North County, um, San Diego. There's a farm called JR Organics, which was one of, the, one of the first organic farms here in San Diego. And I think this year we have somewhere around three or four acres of strawberries going for us that we'll hand process and put into our beer. Um, and it gives us an ability to buy different varietals of fruit that may not necessarily sell well in a commercial base, say on a farmer's market stand. Um, there's one type of strawberry that we really like, it's really good for beer, it's called Patricia. Um, it's actually a pink strawberry. So when they take it to the farmer's market, it doesn't sell well because it doesn't look ripe. So because we're not necessarily looking for the red color, um, it has this amazing deep strawberry flavor and texture to it that we can add into the beer um, and then we can keep this specific varietal of strawberries alive um, and promote biodiversity which is really great um, so with the grain we try to source as locally as possible just because a majority of the weight of what it takes to make the beer is grain so you know we're using hundred thousand pounds a year to make um, our beer um, whereas hops, you know, we're only using one or two thousand pounds of hops. So the closer we can get it to ourselves, the more of an impact it'll have as far as the sustainability of our brand. Um, we've seen um, obviously droughts here in California. Um, so we've started to focus on this um, varietal of barley. Um, it's called Buddha 12 that was um, bred by the University of California Davis to be specifically dry farmed here in California. Um, only one maltster right now is growing using um, that barley varietal, um, Admiral Malting out of Alameda, California. Um, they're using um, this malt um, and it's having a great impact on the quality of the beer, but also um, or the sustainability in our footprint that we leave behind. Go ahead. I was going to say, that's one of the big things too about sourcing locally too, is you help eliminate or reduce that carbon footprint. You know, like we could get blueberries any time of the year we want out of Central America, or we can wait till they come in season locally and purchase them here, you know? So there's a lot of different pros and cons to sourcing locally. Um, but outside of that, not everything's available locally, right? So our coffee comes from our friends in Costa Rica, you know, where I used to live out there. And um, it's all direct from farmer. Um, they get to hand pick the crop every single year. It's all organic, uh, and they hand roast it for us and, and send it to us. And it's shade grown. Yeah, shade grown. So it helps you know the rainforest and yeah, trying to do as much good as we can. You know, sourcing ingredients is super important. You know, it's an agricultural product. We have an impact that we make when, by manufacturing things. So what can we do to help offset that as much as possible? Yeah. On the other hand, hops. Um, they're a huge flavoring agent within the beer, especially with the amount of IPAs that we make. Um, so our goal is just to source the highest quality available. Um, I've been working with a hop broker in Oregon for a long time. Um, so he's able to go out and pick specific lots of hops from farms for us that he knows that I will enjoy because he knows what exactly what I'm looking for. Um, unfortunately, because we source hops from so many different areas, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, New Zealand, Australia, um, continental Europe, um, we, I can't go everywhere to select all these hops. So he is able to bring in large lots of these hops and then select from those things that he knows I will enjoy. Um, we also go farm direct for some other things, um, but it's always dependent, you know, you may, it'd be called citra, right? But there'll be within the citra crop, 
ones that are going to different farms, there'll be many different lots and you know, one citra is not equal to another citra. If you find a good lot, you want to focus on that and use that to produce your beer because honestly, every time you change a lot of hops, it's going to perform differently in the beer that you're making. Unfortunately, we're a really small brewery, um, so we can't make as much of the cans as people would like. Um, and we also want to promote the people reusing um, those. So having a one-use container like a can isn't ideal for the sustainability of our brand. We want people enjoying the beer from a keg or from a growler. Um, it may not be the um, best thing as far as portability goes, but as far as um, sustainability goes, single-use cans isn't really ideal. Um, that's why we don't necessarily focus on them, but we make enough for people to enjoy the beer and cans and trade them and for people to get them out and create a community around our canned beers. Um, our can that unfortunately makes it so our cans don't last very long. Um, so if you kind of, if you miss it, you miss it. But um, we do try to have two can releases a month um, of two different styles, which gives variety to people and makes it worth people's time to come here and wait in line and, you know, enjoy the beer and trade it. <laughs> Definitely the way we construct our tap list in the tasting room is we want to have something there for everyone. So every, the, um, the tap list is very like planned out. It's like the courses of a meal, right? You want the things to complement each other and you want it to be almost like a story. If you were, let's say, to get a taster flight of five beers, you'd be able to go through them and every single one is different, but fulfills a different need within the enjoyment of beer. So um, a lot of what we do is we'll have core beers, but they rotate with the seasons and what fruit we can get. So we have a vanilla cream ale series that we'll use oranges in in the um, winter. We'll use strawberries in in the spring. We also have a, um, a milkshake series, which is almost like a double version of that, where it's a triple IPA, so we're using hops um, and malt to interplay with the flavors um, of these amazing fruit that we're getting. Um, so there's definitely a specific space that every single one of our beers fulfill on our tasting menu. Um, Embrace the Merc, um, it kind of just came from a little bit of the pushback against Hazy IPA initially in the market in San Diego. Hazy IPA started to become a thing and people were saying, oh, this just doesn't look right. It doesn't have enough bitterness. It was kind of just my response to being like, well, embrace the Merc, you know. Um, one really cool thing that we do every year as far as collaborations goes, we do this thing called Power in Numbers, where we bring together all the people that we've worked with over the year and get them all into one place um, for everyone to meet each other, work with each other, make connections, and really just enjoy themselves and have a good time. Um, so this year we have, I think, almost 40 breweries that are going to be part of this collab. Um, They'll be coming out for our anniversary. My favorite collaborations, I have to say, they haven't been released yet, they're in barrels right now, um, but hopefully early next year we'll be able to tell you guys about some really fun stuff that's coming out. Um, I'd say probably one of my favorite beers that we make right now is Rain. Um, you know, having such a, a heavy tap list as far as uh, flavor profiles go, Rain is a real simple, classic German um, unfiltered Pilsner. Uh, really light, crisp, easy drinker, um, and it helps really balance out our tap list right now. And um, yeah, I mean, we just, it's, it's been one of those beers that 
comes comes back every single time and, and tastes amazing and it's just a classic rendition of, of a Pilsner so I'm actually gonna go with a one of our bottled beers that we have um, a lot of the year it's called Madeline uh, so Madeline it's just a great beer um, it's you know bright acidic um, just tart enough, uh, pairs really well with food. And every now and then we'll do collaborations and we'll kind of do variants of it. Like last year, probably one of my favorite beers we ever made, we did a collaboration with Casa Agria where we blended our house Saison with their house Saison and had some wild forested sage with it. And it produced this beer called Saison de Savio and it's just such a great beer. You know, all the, uh, all the farmhouse notes uh, with just enough, um, you know, just enough sour and then that little like hint of sage at the end. It was just a fantastic beer. Uh, Winslow's had his own Flanders strain for quite some time uh, that actually recovered from the ashes of his previous brewery. So we have our, our house Flanders Red, which is Rose Red. Um, but we did a collaboration with our friends over at Celador mm -hmm. um, where we basically blended our Flanders Red with their Flanders Red and we came out with a beer called Syndication. So I'd say that was why my other favorite ones. It's a great one. One Percent for the Planet was started by Yvonne Chouinard and it's basically you're donating one percent of your top line sales to these grassroots environmental organizations that have been vetted through One Percent for the Planet. So uh, locally we donate to San Diego Surfrider, Outdoor Outreach, um, San Diego Coast Keeper and um, nationally and internationally, we just started working with a, an amazing organization called Conservation Alliance. So not only do we try and donate, you know, or do we donate money um, to these organizations, but we also try and donate time as well. Um, and that's a that's a big piece for us and for our employees to you know really get out there and experience it, and you know in many cases get our hands dirty and you know start start seeing what it really takes to affect positive change in you know our current business environment and you know the current. Uh, the current environmental environment as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously my um, path with brewing and beer and fermentation has been a really interesting experience. You know, it's not just a job for me. It's not just um, something to spend my time. It's not just a hobby. It's something that I can truly like work at every day and still not know everything about it. I can learn every day I can I come in and I can share the things that I learned with other people in the form of a liquid, which is really amazing and um, truly rewarding. To be able to create and make something actual tangible in this world that you can put out into this world and be like, you know, I made this. That That's something really unique for me. Um, and then I just think in general, like how you can become connected to the whole process is a really interesting piece for me. You know, how you can be connected to the farmers and the land and the ingredients all the way through the process to, you know, to the beer in your glass. You know, that's what we always say is, you know, we like to tell a story so you can hear about you know, all of the things behind the beer in your glass to give it context and so, you know, to help give reverence to that beer in your glass. And, you know, being part of that entire story is, you know, I think really interesting and intriguing to me, you know, just uh, being part of that story and being able to share and tell that story with others. Yeah, I mean, to me, I guess the brewing itself um, obviously is one aspect, but the business as, an, as a whole, um, is a little bit more important to me than just the making of the beer because having a brewery and creating a product like that helps kind of establish a community um, and a community that we can help grow with and be part of as well. So the beer community and outside of that just the general community and beer is one of those things that brings people together you know and, and we've met some amazing people um, but outside of just the community itself as we grow and become more popular our audience continues to grow it gives us a platform to where we can deliver messages like this to people and help spread awareness, you know, to some ways to be a little bit more sustainable, you know, what's going on in the world, how people can, you know, help have a positive impact and stuff like that. Because as we continue to grow and become more and more popular, our audience continues to grow and that way our message gets delivered even further. So that's one thing that excites me the most about the future is being able to have that voice and that pedestal to stand on. Yeah. And our employees. We have amazing employees. Yeah. We have a 
we were we've been super blessed and uh, we never have a really killer family so we're excited you